Thank you all so much for uh, for being here. Um, this is a fairly informal kind of thing, um, and uh, but we, we hope that this will be a lot of useful information to help you understand what this program is, how you might be able to fit into that. Um, I'm really delighted to see so many people who I don't think have done the SAGE program before. Um, that's um, that's a, a really good thing. Um, let's go ahead and if we could uh, get started. And I, of course, neglected to ask anyone to give a prayer, but I'll ask Grant, um, as a member of the SAGE committee, if you would be willing to, to do that for us and get started. Our eternal Father, we're thankful for this day, for the university, for the opportunities to direct programs and we ask thy spirit to direct us, help us to keep our students foremost in mind in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Grant. Um, let me, um, I'm going to start by just kind of introducing what is SAGE, what are SAGE programs, and then we're going to um, uh, to hear a little bit more uh, from uh, Matt uh, Dearden, who is the chair of Experience Design um, and a SAGE veteran of some of some years to talk a little bit about the kind of the gold standard for what we're looking for in terms of stage program um, designing experience. Um, and uh, then we're going to hear from uh, Jessica Green, who's the Assistant uh, Director of General Education, um, who's going to walk us through a little bit about the application uh, process. And then we're going to have time for Q&A um, at the end. Now, um, some of you, uh, well, let, let me start uh, this way by doing just a few introductions. Um, I should introduce myself a little bit more. Um, I'm Chip Oscarson. I'm the Director of General Education, uh, Associate Dean here in Undergraduate Education, and the Chair of the SAGE Committee. Now, the SAGE Committee was organized about four or five years ago um, with a kind of recognition that there was some pretty loose oversight over um, uh, programs that were study abroad programs that are going out of a, kind of a general education nature. Um, and, um, and particularly for the London Center, there needed to be um, some kind of curricular uh, oversight. And so for these reasons, uh, the SAGE program was, uh, was organized. What SAGE programs are in their strictest definition is that any uh, study abroad program that has more than three credits of general education falls under the supervision of the, the SAGE committee and needs to go through uh, that, that application process. Um, and uh, there's there's more on our, our website, which we've recently revamped. If I could remember how to do the lights in this room, I'll, I'll try once and if they're, they're <laughs> um, it's always been a little bit of a mystery continues to be a mystery. Um, I don't know how to get the front bank done. Um, but there's a lot of information on our website that we've recently kind of revamped, and we're going to kind of use that to, uh, to go off of today. As the chair of the SAGE committee, though, on that committee, we have um, representatives from <laughs> it's all or nothing. Wait, that, might, that maybe is good to, to be able to just see what's on here a little bit better. Um, let me introduce a few of the people who are on the SAGE committee. Um, Grant Lundberg, uh, who gave our, our prayer, is from the College of Humanities. Um, we have Eric Dursteller uh, from Family, Home, and Social Science um, as well in the History Department. Uh, we have Rob McFarland, who is uh, the uh, European Studies Director in the Kennedy Center and uh, in the German Department. Uh, we have Matt Dearden, uh, who I mentioned is from Exercise, um, not exercise the Experience yes. Design. Yes. There's an EX in that word, yes. Experience Design. Um, and uh, Cecilia Peake, who will be joining us or might be is joining us soon um who is the resident director of the one uh, the uh the i guess her official time right now is interim resident director at the london center uh she's also on that program and of course jessica green who we have to thank for uh, preparing uh, spread here in the, in the meeting helping to get us uh, organized uh that is the committee and the work that what the committee does is that they um review applications for uh, for sage programs and then once sage programs are accepted there's a committee member that's assigned as a uh, kind of a consultant uh, to help with um uh, the development of of the program uh to the point where you start working with the international studies program office uh, isp and um and then we review uh, programs we ask you to kind of fill out a report when you get back so that we um get a little bit of a sense of what is it that happened we're interested in in finding out you know what are some of our best practices and and seeing what we can do to, to implement they help out with training as well i guess one of the committee member that i should mention is uh, julie swallow um who is uh, the uh, general education uh, lia well, sorry, she's the Center for Teaching and Learning Liaison to General Education, and she helps out quite a bit with that as well. 
So they're spread out around the, the, the room intentionally to, uh, to be there to help answer questions. Now, the, the way that most SAGE programs operate um, is as a team taught um, endeavor. Um, so the, the program that we send the, the most is to London. There's some particular things about the London because of the London Center. Um, and uh, Cecilia is, a, is really, really helpful and willing to answer specific questions that you might have about that. We're gonna get some more information on the website about the peculiarities of, of London. But the basic idea behind SAGE programs is uh, faculty members from different programs um, come together to, uh, uh, to design an experience for students that's integrated um, and it's aligned with, with learning outcomes um, and makes use of the location where they are. And those locations historically, London is uh, one that I've mentioned. Uh, we uh, have access to the, uh, the BYU apartment in uh, Paris uh, during certain terms and semesters, uh, Madrid, um, uh, Vienna, and then uh, historically we've uh, regularly sent programs to Greece and, uh, and Italy. Um, and we're open to, to other locations. We're excited for other locations. Uh, we have our first that I know of our first non-European uh, destination this uh, summer, uh, and Luke Howard is taking a group to Sydney, Australia. Um, that's that's the first, but we realize that we, we would like to, to diversify the offerings of SAGE more um, to reach more students. Um, recently, we've also changed the curricular possibilities on SAGE that will likewise hopefully open it up to more faculty being able to be involved. Uh, previously, it was such that if you taught a general education course in your department, um, you know, say you were in biology and it was bio 100, you know, it didn't always make sense to teach a bio 100 class in Paris necessarily, right? Uh, there was a lot of uh, demands on that curriculum to keep it consistent with what's um, also taught here on campus. What we are making available are a series of UNIV numbers that cover general education requirements, but are not, um, are not tied uh, to specific content uh, that uh, needs to be delivered here on campus. Uh, it allows for, for there to be some variation. There are some, uh, there's some peculiar, well, peculiarities. There's some, uh, these, these classes we would like to be taught in a certain kind of way. And so people using these UNIV classes, we ask to participate in a workshop that just can, um, and uh, Julie run on a regular basis to help you kind of get the vision of what it is. It's more inquiry-based learning. Um, it's more deliberate about incorporating, um, you know, a reflection on the intersection between faith and the discipline. They're a little bit more interdisciplinary. They're not introductions to a discipline, uh, in other words. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about unit classes later on and, and how those might be used. That is probably one of the most challenging parts of putting together a proposal in that there are things like the unit classes, like, I don't know if I fully understand that. You know, help me understand that. Um, and, and the members of the SAGE committee, myself, Jessica, were more than willing to talk with you that you're doing something together, but also be aware that our anticipation of what is turned in at the November 1st deadline for SAGE proposals um, is we do not see that necessarily as a, a final product at all. We understand that there's a lot of things that we need to also kind of educate you on and, and that there'll be time for that, that what we're looking for is that there's the the kind of the, the kernel of a, of a good idea and a, and a feasible idea uh, at that, okay? So that's kind of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the very basics. Um, Jessica, if you could uh, go to the first, um, uh, first tab here. Uh, I just wanna orient you quickly to the, what's on the, uh, uh, the website. Um, this uh, What is Sage goes through a lot of the things that I've just uh, talked about, uh, including you know, who is it that can uh, direct Sage programs, uh, faculty need to have CFS status. They need to um, have an established track re record of excellent teaching. Um, they need to have expertise to, to teach the classes they're proposing to teach. Um, and I mean, that, that sounds like the most straightforward thing in the world, but it is not, right? Um, if you are you know, in the social sciences and are saying, I would really like to teach the biological sciences class, um, you know, the, that, that raises, uh, that raises uh, questions. Um, there needs to be, uh, you know, appropriate experience to, you know, to lead a group. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that you're fluent in all the languages that uh, where you will be going, uh, although that is a strong preference. Um, and there definitely needs to be experience, if not kind of fluency in the, in the language. And uh, very importantly, you, you need to have support from your home department and care. Uh, we, we don't get into uh, getting between, between your relationship between uh, you and them. Okay. 
Um, there's, uh, I'm not going to go through everything in fine uh, tooth detail here, but there's a description of what makes for a strong SAGE program, uh, the, the kinds of things that we're uh, looking for, um, and a uh, list of those uh, unit classes. I, I mentioned, if you can go down a little bit more here, these are the criteria we're looking for in a proposal, right? Um, that there's, you know, alignment um, between the, uh, the uh, what's being proposed and, and TV objectives. Uh, there's integration. We, we don't want there to be, here's one random class and here's another random class and here's a third random class, you know, that students can take. We want you to think about um, integration across classes um, to the point that if you're uh, going uh, on a semester length program to London, um, you might think of doing where well, one faculty teaches one class, one faculty teaches another class that, you know, kind of interface with each other, and then the two faculty team teach a third class, and then have Cecilia teach one more class. Um, something like that, where they're all speaking, uh, you know, all the classes are speaking to each other in, in some uh, fundamental kind of way, and that there's something that links these classes together. Matt will give you some, uh, some ideas about how to, uh, to think a little about that, but that's that integration. I mentioned the director qualification, and there needs to be um, uh, clearly uh, a goal to help the students develop uh, the, the knowledge, skills, and dispositions uh, that they need uh, to, uh, to improve in intercultural competency. Um, this happens, a, a lot of times we assume that this happens uh, by serendipity, um, and we need to be a little bit more intentional about, about doing this sometimes. So this, this needs to be something that's uh, that's reflected. So again, this is on the website that you can kind of use, um, and uh, we'll we'll touch on on some of this a little bit later on. Um, at this point, um, Matt, why don't we have you talk a little bit about uh, program design, um, and then we'll get into some more particulars with uh, with Justin. I'll use the whiteboard if that's okay. Yeah. You want mine? Uh, yeah. And I'll the it's no, it's where it chips at. If you just push the screen off, I think we'll be okay. Okay. Um, this is exciting that you're here. Stage programs are awesome. Uh, I've co directed uh, two winter semesters at the London Center with Jamin Rowan, and I think both of us agree it's probably the most powerful and impactful professional experience either of us have had. Um, especially speaking towards to, to this integrated aspect of the curriculum, which we're hoping to see in SAGE programs. Going through that process for Jamin and I have led to an unexpected uh, connections course that we taught in the honors program for three years and an interdisciplinary research grant that we're currently doing on the neuroscience of storytelling with Dan Dewey and linguistics and Jamila Hodge and my program. So there's just been and that, that's not even to speak of the relationships with students and the impact on our families. It's just been really uh, one of the most um, cherished parts of my BYU experience thus far. And what really, I think, um, helped Jamin and I, uh, we sort of like snuck in through like a back door because neither of us had been uh, study abroad directors. Um, uh, so we were lucky to be able to go and, and teach at the London Center and was uh, I think we were one of the first, if not the first SAGE programs, at least in in London. Um, and, and to Chip's point, our first proposal was very different from what we actually ended up doing. Um, but we, we, Jamie and I got some money to go over to uh, London in advance um, in May of 2019 to do some site visits and think about curriculum. And mainly what we did is we just talked about the curriculum a lot and coming from business and he's in English figuring out where was the intersection. And I can't remember where we were in London. I have a memory that we were like walking by Hyde Park and talking about the curriculum. I think this, this was preceded by a conversation about what our spirit animals were. Um, so we covered all topics. Jamin is a raccoon because he's like a consummate scavenger, if any of you know uh, uh, Jamin Rowan. Um, anyways, we, we stumbled upon this question of what do we want students to say when they go home from our program? And that, that question led us down this path of agreement on we wanted our students to be able to say that they were more curious and creative as a result of their time in London. And for us, this became sort of this pro- um, 
program uh, level uh, learning outcome. And subsequently, let's see if I put a better marker. Subsequently, we've actually written two papers on this. This evolved into um, what we now call transformative learning outcomes. So we've written a couple of pieces on this um, around this idea of rat, like in addition to articulating what you want, what you hope your students uh, know and are able to do <clears throat> out of a learning experience, also articulating for them um, who you would hope they become, right? In terms of identity and, and ways of viewing the world. And so for us, it was, um, we wanted our student, students to become more curious and creative. And at this point, we had we had the courses, the four courses identified that we had proposed. And we had talked about maybe we have a joint project that we share across them. But once we hit on this program learning outcome, it led us down this path of eventually deciding to just co-teach in collaboration with Alan Phillips, who was the was the director at the time, uh, all 12 credits together. So we want to we were we offered um, instead of offering four separate courses, it was just one course, even on the back end, like we, you know, in terms of the credit students were getting, they were getting three uh, or, or three credits for four dist distinctive courses. Uh, Jamin and I just rolled it all into sort of this one thing that we, we co-taught. And so, um, and, and that was awesome because what it allowed us to do is to, you know, a lot of times when I develop courses, it's okay, what's the content? What do I want them to read? What are the assignments? Um, and with, you know, with a study abroad, you also layer in uh, sites and experiences. Um, and then you, you sort of build uh, the course that way. Um, but for us, we really try to hear to this idea of, no, this is the lens. If it doesn't somehow connect to um, helping our students become more curious and creative, even if that's what we traditionally teach in our disciplines and um, we weren't going to do it. Or sites, right? Like we had to push back a little bit on a couple of things because the, the Kennedy Center is like, no, well, London Center students always do this. And London Center students don't like to do this. They do like to do this. And it took us a bit to say like, no, like we, we get that, but we if if we don't think the site visit or the experience connects to our learning outcomes, then we're just not going to do it. And the students can do those things on their own and to be really specific, right? And there was something else that Rick Gill said in an honors training um, that resonated with Jamin and I. Um, you know, uh, this is more in the context of the unexpected connections courses. Um, but the idea is, you know, if, if any of you have done the unexpected connections course or have it, the, you know, it's similar in some ways to a SAGE program. Two faculty from different disciplines come together and propose a course, right? Um, that is an integration. And Rick was saying, you know, we don't want just like one day, one faculty member who shows up and like, here's my take on this topic. And then the next day, the other faculty comes up. It's like, no, really, we want you to come together and leave your disciplines and create like a third discipline, like a new sandbox to play in together. And, and this resonated with Jamin and I too, because we would bring in competencies and content from our disciplines as examples of how experienced designers or um, literary critics or writers exhibit curiosity and creativity. And here are competencies from our disciplines that we're gonna to apply to becoming more curious and creative um, during our time um, in London. Now, this isn't to say that you need to, you know, teach all of the courses together. It might be a hybrid model, like Chip was saying, where you each teach one, at least at the London Center, and Cecilia teaches a course, and then you co-teach something. But for us, like having program level learning outcomes uh, was, was really helpful from a curricular standpoint. It helped us to make decisions about what content, uh, where we went, and what we did. Um, and it also, what, what was unexpected is, this is the first time, and you guys probably write better learning outcomes than I do, but this is the first time in my career where I had students who actually knew what the learning outcomes were <laughs> because it just became part of the vernacular. Like we were always talking about curiosity and creativity and they talked about it and they were also able, especially in SAGE programs, I think this is important to consider, is um, 
you're not just going to have students from your disciplines, right? You're going to have students from across campus and, and they're going to have a great time with you and, and just traveling is going to be impactful, but you want them to be able to take what they've learned and like transport that with them back into their discipline, right? And, and if, it's, if it seems disconnected or still interesting, but some discipline over here and like this was really great to learn about culture in France, but I'm an econ major and I don't know how to like bring that back over. And some students do this well. They can like figure that out. But I think this really helped our students say, yeah, you know, I'm studying communication disorders and, and here's how I can be more curious and creative as a professional in that space or as a student in that space. And so this, this became just part of our vernacular and also allowed people to more easily, we think, transport um, what they gain in London uh, back home with them uh, again. I think that's all that I have to say. Any questions or I think I can chat more later about this too, but general, some general thoughts on curriculum. So Matt, it was just you and Jamin and then with the center director and you guys were all working in collaboration, but at what point did you guys start? Yeah, figuring this class structure out, you know what I mean? Well, we were doing it probably about a year in advance. Okay. And it was a little bit different when Matt and Jamin were there and that Alan Phillips, the, the director at the time, was not a faculty member, so he couldn't teach classes. So he had to integrate in different ways. That that model has changed. And so Cecilia is um, a resident director that she is assigned uh, both fall and winter to teach one class. So if you're proposing a fall or winter program to London, you have to think about how you would incorporate her. She is flexible. She will work with with people and both on in terms of the class that she'll teach, but as well as with um, uh, you know giving you ideas of of context that she has that she might be able to facilitate for the things that you're doing. Yeah, so it's not showing. I was just saying. Oh, Cecilia's here. Excellent. Oh, there's Cecilia right there. Disciplinary background. Cecilia, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes, I can do that. Um, I apologize. For, I was about 14 minutes late. It's a long story that I will not recount, but I was filing an insurance claim and that's as much as, much as I'll say about that. Um, so yeah, um, I'm BYU faculty. My home department is um, comparative arts and letters and uh, I'm a professor of classics in that, in that department. Uh, I've directed as a faculty director four different London programs and, and two other traveling study abroads. And I've been at the London Center for a year now, and will be here for at least um, at least through August of 2025. So, um, I've had a lot of London experience, a lot of experience here at the center. I think it's um, and and the, whoever the resident director is, whether it's me or whether it ends up being somebody else in the future, um, they they will be you know part of part of their contractual obligation to the London Center and to BYU is to teach one class fall and one class winter. Um, as J as uh, as Matt was suggesting, there are a number of different ways uh, that this might happen, right? It could be some kind of, as he said, sort of hybrid model where you know each faculty teaches an individual class. Maybe they team teach a class, and the resident director teaches a separate class. Um, I, for one, am open to the prospect of team teaching a class with with incoming directors for fall and winter. Um, but I, I want to support any incoming faculty. Um, the best way I can to make sure that they're having designing and experiencing the program as, as they want to design and experience it. So I have a lot of experience at the London Center. I will effectively be kind of a director or whoever the resident director is will effectively be kind of a director with you. Um, but but really the two faculty proposing the, the London SAGE program when, when it is at the London Center You've put a lot of thought into this, and I and I want I for one want to be able to support the vision that you have for your program and just discuss ways that. And I think I think you need to be able to say, as Matt did, lots of London programs do lots of similar activities because there are certain popular activities in London. But if you if there's something that you feel really fits with your curriculum and other programs haven't necessarily done it, or you know, other programs have done things and, and you're thinking that doesn't really fit our curriculum, don't do it or do do it as the case may be, depending on cost and how it fits. Um, some things certainly work better than others in, in my experience. And anyway, I'd be happy to meet with any potential applicants to London Center programs. 
over Zoom separately from this orientation meeting and answer any questions you have about the center, the operation of the center, my role at the center, and, and how I can help you, you know, prepare a SAGE proposal basically for the London Center, which I'd be very, very happy to do. Good. Thanks, Cecilia. Thanks for uh, for uh, joining us in uh, on this. Uh, the London Center is a little bit unique in, in some of the ways that it runs and that it does have a third. Um, and as Cecilia uh, intimated that her um, her official title is interim right now, but I think you know the programs that you'll be proposing will be after that interim period is over. But I think you can plan with Cecilia or a Cecilia like person in mind. Um, and that uh, there might, you know, potentially be changed, but I, I think it'll functionally work much the same. Um, and and she's a great. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, I yeah. think it'll be I think it'll be a BYU faculty who will be in fact able to teach. Yeah, yeah, that that is pretty much the the model that we're committed to. Are there, are there questions you have for Cecilia? I, I have a question. Well, it's a, yeah. In the flyer, it talks like, it lists London available summer twenty twenty seven but not before or after that. So is that just because those are already set? They're already set. They're already set. Okay. After so that is set? Not after that. Oh, just fall. Yeah. It said summer 27 and then after fall 27 didn't say London. So I just didn't know. There is a, there's already a program for fall of 27, right? I'm, I think no. it's winter and summer that are open. Is that correct? Oh, okay. winter, is, winter is open. Yeah, it's just, we, have, we already have programs for spring and fall and then all of 26 right now. It's an awesome time to do London too. I'm just going to put in a plug for winter. Um, I agree. People often don't apply for winter uh, just because, you know, but, but the weather's no worse in London than it is in Provo in the winter. <laughs> and as a non-winter sports person, it's actually better in my view. And, um, you know, you go from the cold and you kind of transition into spring and that is a beautiful, beautiful season to be in the United Kingdom. And in January and February, it's it's probably the nicest time of year to be doing things like museum visits, the British Museum, the National Gallery. You know, they're not mobbed the way they are during spring, summer, and and much of fall. So, anyway, I I love winter semester here, and my first London program as a faculty director was a winter program, and it was it was a fantastic experience. Okay. So you don't were, shy away. Summer is by far the most popular because of family schedules. It's the easiest that we understand. Spring is also a popular one. It's, it's least disruptive to the other things that we're, we're committed to doing on campus. Um, and then fall and then winter. So, and, and what we typically do is when we get applications that we will, <clears throat> we'll kind of rank them and, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, people state what their preference for, you know, for term or semester is, we'll, we'll rank them. Kind of go back to him saying, you know, congratulations, been accepted. Does this still work for you? Um, and in cases where we feel there's a strong program, but um, it didn't, but there was a competing program for the same time that, I mean, we just basically look at what are the, all the availabilities and how can we accommodate as many people as possible? So if you've said, well, my second, you know, I, I could do this. It's not my first option, but this is my second option, but it helps get us another program in that we might come back and ask, would that be all right for you to do that? Like a different time or a different, different time. Person. Yeah. So don't, you don't necessarily need to feel what because I've just put down this semester, that's the only one I think considered for. We'll consider a few that first and foremost. But um, if we feel like there's a you know there's a viable program here, we might come back to you and, and say, what would you think about doing it spring instead or um, you know, fall instead of winter, or, you know, something like that. And I think I had heard, did is it true that we bought the building next to the London Center? Is that now open and in use? It, it's not open for um, SAGE programs. Uh, so 27 and 29 are the two buildings that BYU has owned since the early 1970s. And and that's, those are the two buildings that house the, the London Center general education programs. Uh, in 2020, BYU purchased 31 and it underwent a renovation. Most of those flats are being used to house BYU students who are doing London internships and they're separate from the London program. Um, we've had faculty for the programs and we do in fact this semester have one of the faculty families directing uh, living in that building um, because the, the, the flat, this building 29, which is where the faculty flats historically have been, one of the flats has three bedrooms one of the flats has only one bedroom. And so if you've got two faculty directors coming with family, that that can be rather challenging, right? You basically end up with your kids on a sofa bed, you know, for the semester. So so they have been making use of 31 um, as needed for, for faculty families. I don't know. 
they were saying they weren't going to continue doing that, but right now they're still doing that. So, um, but but no um, London Center students stay in 31. Uh, BYU student interns who are who are doing internships in London are the ones using the flats in 31. My other question is: so it's awesome to know that there's like a regional expert that's familiar, but for a for some of these other locations, what kind of support is there to sort of know like what kinds of things we can do or what kind of support is on the ground. You mentioned like there's a Paris apartment, but are the other ones sort of like it's it's a little bit flux? more it's more it's a little bit more limited, quite honestly. Um we do have some resources on the SAGE committee, people who have been to these places and know uh these different apartments is kind of where we have an intentional spread that way. Uh, the ISP coordinators, Malcolm is back here from the ISP office, um, know a lot about, <laughs> the, you know, because they've been advising, um, you know, people. And then we have experts in uh, the various language departments as well that can be a, a great resource. So Chris, you know, for example, you know, I'm sure would be happy to talk with someone who's going to, you know, to Paris, um, you know, and using the Paris apartment, having been there and, and done that. So we can help, but we don't have a resident director in quite the same way. Sounds like we're dancing without a but like in Austria, there's the Austro-American Institute, and they do seventy percent of your um, of your work. They they do all the housing, they do things like, for all your students, they book your trips, they do things like this. So there's and it's the same thing happens in Paris. Right? Yeah. So in Paris, we work with we have an agency, a couple agencies that we can work with there uh, to house students and plan things. That's um, Spain. It's really great. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not like it's not like it's you and one. And, okay. I, I always get this feeling that people are so terrified that they have to kind of cling to the London Center as a concept. Yeah. We, we yeah. know where our students are going to sleep. We know where our apartment actually is. We know what's in the drawers in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that that thing is over in 24 hours. What you know when you land in your other Got place, it. you have an apartment and things like that. And the rest of it is really great. Not having your students live in the same building with you. Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. So just like think I, London's wonderful. I'm doing the London uh, the fall of 27. I'm excited. Um, but we, I've done eight study abroads in other places and I love them. And you know, I've done I've done uh, you know, in Berlin and Vienna. There's all there's there's lots and lots of possibilities, rich possibilities there, even if you don't know these places. And even, you know, if, if one of you doesn't speak the language or something. And, and if really I can nice. add on my last study abroad. Um, the uh, in the Kennedy Center in the ISP office, Trish Donaldson planned everything for us. We didn't use the agency in France because she did everything for us and she did it better than they have ever done. And for a fraction of the price, probably. Uh, yeah, didn't charge us. I mean, they charge crazy rates and it, sometimes it's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. sometimes that's the way to go because yeah. it saves you the work and that's important. I mean, yeah, so they can help with everything too. How many students do you plan for? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. This is something that you have to kind of work out in the budgeting process when, once you sit down with ISP. But generally speaking, and Malcolm, correct me if I'm off base, um, it's a little bit dependent on location. The more expensive the location, the more students you're going to need to, you know, to help cover all costs. If you're going with two faculty members, which you must if you're going to London, um, and it's recommended if you're going other, other places, um, you're probably in the neighborhood of 24 to 30 students-ish. Um, if you are a single um, director going, depending on how you're covering the classes, if you're using, I always want to say the Austro-Hungarian, but it's the Austro-American <laughs> Institute or L'Etoile in, in Paris or, or something like this, um, you, you can go as a single director using them to help cover you know, another uh, class uh, for you. You can usually do it more like 15 to 20 students-ish. Yeah. I think something to also think about is how to manage the number of students with one faculty and if you have more students, two faculties allows you to manage that engagement dynamic better than with a larger group, right? How often is it one faculty? Um, my understanding was that it was always two. Yeah, it's, it is, um, for, for a while we were insisting on, on two faculty always, but we've kind of backed off of that saying, well, in non-London locations, we're willing to consider proposals of one faculty as long as there's a clear strategy for um, for how you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, because um, we don't want you going and teaching three classes yourself during a summer term. That's not fair. Uh, even two classes can can be heavy. 
Um, and it's nice if you can, if you have a partner on the ground that can help. Gary? So Jeff, on a one faculty program, a graduate TA could be utilized, Good. right? So and, that's, that's and they're going to have to, we we'll have to kind of figure that into the, the budgeting process. Um, and so there's always a cost benefit, you know, sort of thing that you have to figure out. The other, the other budget thing is how many, if you're bringing family members with you, that, that determines. I wanted to ask, you've brought family. Mm -hmm. You and Jamin both have yeah. adult children. Many children, yeah. How does that work? It's amazing. It's awesome. How does it work logistically with like the funding or the whatever, like does BYU just support a family? Yeah, yeah they do. And, and quite generously in my experience, like they'll pay for your family's travel, right? To and to and from locations. Um, if you're doing say Paris or Vienna, or of course, London housing is provided for you and your family. Um, here at the London center, many meals are covered as well in, in the cost of, of you coming. And so, you know, you, you could theoretically get breakfast and um, for your family every single day and dinner for your family most, not every single day, breakfast six days a week and, and dinner most nights. So there's good provision there. Um, I think, uh, you know, logistically, that'll kind of depend on your, your own family dynamic, right? Like I was the faculty, um, my husband wasn't. And so, you know, we the first time we came, we had our two younger children with us, our two older, our girls didn't come, but our boys came. And so he, he just agreed to kind of be the guy in charge of, you know, well, a lot of things, frankly, but, but among other things, you know, our kids, when I, when I had to teach and, and do program related things. Um, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that um, if you, I mean, we have directed, it wasn't a, a SAGE program actually, but we, but I did direct a spring program where I was the only faculty director and we had 32 students and if I had been a less experienced director, that would have been really difficult to manage. But but I had several study abroads under my belt by then. And, you know, my husband had also by then the, the same several study abroads under his belt. Um, and so like if a student got sick and I was in the middle of lecturing, he was able to get the students, you know, where they needed to go to get medical attention or to visit a doctor to, to check on them or whatever it is. So, you know, I think it, it partly depends on your experience, right? I mean, you probably wouldn't want to try to do 32 students alone if it's your first study abroad and, and not go with another faculty director. Um, but anyway, for families, there's, um, I think there's very generous, very generous support on the programs. When you're setting up the budget, basically the way it's worked before is anything that the students are doing as part of the program, like your family is built into that budget to do all the same thing. Right. So they just, I mean, just did everything that we were doing with the student. That's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. Right. I'm just curious how that shifts if you're in the non-London space. So I understand BYU owns an apartment in Vienna, Paris, et cetera. What about two directors with each having a family? So we, we have to secure a second apartment through Airbnb or something. Got it. Yeah. Part of the budget. But it's not something that we need, that, that would limit us from being able to co-direct something. Not necessarily. What, what it will mean um, is that you're going to have to have more students. Yeah. Um, and if you have Because the price will go up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Jessica, should we give you a couple minutes and then we'll open yeah. up for, for further questions and we'll hang around here afterwards if you, if you want to linger. So I just wanted to highlight where to find information um, as you're moving forward. So the important dates to remember Proposals are due November 1st, and then the SAGE committee will come together and deliberate. And so we're hoping to get you a decision um, by the end of December, so that way you can say definitively yes or no. Um, so where to find information? So this is just ge.byu.edu and then SAGE, or you can come through um, the general education website, right? If you come through GE and then faculty, and then here's our study web programs. So other information that will probably be useful as you're thinking about, uh, Chip went over the what is SAGE. Um, this upcoming and past SAGE programs is really useful um, in part because you can see, as was pointed out here, where uh, we have gaps for London and other places, but just recognizing that we're really open to other locations and, and like Chip said, excited to maybe see new places that we haven't seen proposals from before. The other thing that I get a lot of questions about is faculty want, want to see like examples of SAGE programs that have gone. And so we have several years worth of SAGE programs. Um, what is going to show up there is just their sort of ISP recruiting poster. Thumbs up, maybe not. Yeah. 
So it's different than the proposal that you're going to submit, which I'll show in just a second, but this will kind of give you a sense of like, what themes did people pick? Um, did they kind of know ahead of time, like curiosity and creativity, like Matt was talking about? Um, other things to look at further down, you can see what classes. So like this one, they offered four UNIV classes. Um, also on the website, if you have questions about those UNIV classes, there's a little bit of information there, but really reach out to a SAGE committee member if you have questions about that. So I think that's really helpful as you're thinking through like, okay, maybe I'm thinking of Spain. Who else has gone to Spain? What did their program look like? Um, what classes or fields were they studying? And then um, the last thing that I want to talk about is just the proposal form. Chip kind of alluded to this one. Um, it's pretty brief. So we do get a lot of faculty members who have questions like how much detail you're really looking for. Um, we've done these text boxes. That's about the amount of text that we're looking for. So sometimes we'll get a proposal that's just pages and pages. They've already like mapped out their itinerary. Like Cecilia was saying, sometimes um, it's it's better to be a little more brief because that will leave you open for feedback from experienced folks that have already taught there. Um, so this is the program theme, right? So you're going to write a couple paragraphs there. You can lay out um, what semesters and places you're interested in. You can put notes in here if you have like, okay, spring would work in this location for me, um, but not in this other location. Um, you can provide as much detail as you want there. Um, we are asking that you kind of give us a sense of like what classes would make sense for this. But again, that's something that might change as you talk to ISP or your stage committee member. And then lastly, um, Chip alluded to this as well. We really need you to make sure that you have department support. We will never move forward without your department saying um, that you're, you're eligible to teach. Any questions about putting together this proposal? Okay, awesome. We'll turn it back to Chip. Okay. Um, how many of you are uh, in need of a partner or you're, you're interested in, in partnering, but don't necessarily have someone, maybe okay, it's a couple of you. We'll, we'll be reaching out um, to uh, we've handled this differently. And, and one of the thoughts I've had is that we might have you fill out like a little profile kind of thing that we can exchange you know, for. <laughs> I was not going to say that. But <laughs> that um, but to kind of circulate to know who else is out there looking and, and you might find someone going, oh, and then you can, you know, go to lunch and talk about it, see if there's something, something. <laughs> so maybe I'm making it sound weirder than I meant to. Just but, love it. But, <laughs> but again, I, I know it can be hard. There's different cultures and different colleges. Sometimes you don't know people outside, you know, your program as much and, and it's really helpful. We do there, you know, there have been cases where people from the same program have gone on uh, on a SAGE program, but we really discourage it. And um, and when we see those applications, as good as some of the ideas are in it, sometimes we, you know, will almost always pass over them for another program because we really want the interdisciplinary dimension of this, right? That's what the unit classes are allowing and inviting. And we really want to see um, something that, that crosses these boundaries to, to get to kind of what Matt was talking about, where the focus is on these kind of transferable skills as opposed to, you know, developing specific disciplinary skills. Um, so say just one other thing quick yeah. about that, Chip. I, I'd say that the other thing that the program level learning outcomes can help with is that like partnership with someone. If you're both like on board with that, that really helps as opposed to like, oh, I'd like to go to London and this other person wants to go to London. That's probably not enough to like guarantee you're gonna have a good partnership. And and you take on the role of like instructor and logistics person and parent and all of these other things and you're doing all of this stuff together, it's really great to feel like you've got a somebody who you can like work on all those things with. You do need at least two dates is what you're telling me, maybe three. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All four seasons. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what what kinds of questions have, have come up as we've been talking about this? So I know there's been like a lot of really um big hints that there's a new GE program coming, but we don't exactly know what that is, except to say that there's like no substitutions and no double counting. So I'm just like that's not putting any of this in threat, right? With the UNIV courses counting as no, something. And in fact, um, at the risk of saying more than I, I should say, because there's you know, spoilers. There's, <laughs> but the, the UNIV classes, there are some of these UNIV classes that are actually being taught here on campus as well mm -hmm. right now. Uh, Matt's teaching one right now in, um, in uh, out of plant and wildlife science. And um, 
I, we don't know exactly what new categories, how they're going to be defined, things like that. But if I was wagering a bet that new GE classes are going to look more, more like the kind of thing that we're talking about cool. here than what we currently have. Cool. Um, so, but, yeah. but I don't, I, yeah. Yeah. That's, it, that's about all the information that I know too. So to follow up on that, it makes more sense to propose these univ classes than to assume that some class that you're teaching will count for. Um, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, I, I've been worrying about that for four years. And, um, and I just, we have no idea of knowing when a new thing will, will come and hit. For the time frame that you're working on, we'll work it out. <laughs> so if you want to use a current existing general education course, by all means, propose it. Um, that's that's not a problem. I think that we can do it and, and that there's going to be students on new and old programs and equivalencies frontwards and backwards that we're going to have to figure out how we're doing that anyway, that I would not worry about that at this point. We're we're years from having a fully implemented new general education program. Yeah. Good question. Yes. I'm curious about the, the, the unit, the training for the unit courses. Do you have that scheduled or where would we go to find that? Yeah, we don't have one happening this fall because we were kind of waiting for some more details, but we continually have study abroad folks that are wanting to teach this and uh, the UNIV numbers. So we would probably run one again this winter. And depending on what you propose, we just kind of offer them as needed. So we did three last year or three this year. We did one winter and two spring summer. So. And in connection with that, there um, it's a four-part workshop, and we ask you to do some work. <laughs> We're asking you to redesign a curriculum, and so there's a, a stipend that comes with that as well. And that stipend can be used, um, especially if you can find some matching funds from your department, um, to, to do some scouting trips. A lot of people have used, uh, Matt alluded to that, that, that Matt and Jamin did something similar, using uh, matching funds to go and scout out location, which can, can be helpful. I'd also say with that, that that's like this, this like this time to like talk with your partner about your program and also just like how you teach and all of those things. So that was, I mean, I think it, like it was great that we got to go to London. We could have gone to like Bicknell for a week and gotten a lot of the benefits of just like talking like 24 seven about the program. It just takes time to like figure out what it is that you want to do and how you want to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. immersion. Oh, there's, there's all sorts of infrastructure set up all over the place and we have these places in you know, Madrid and in uh, Paris and, and uh, Rome and Vienna and in London. Um, there's a lot of other places around the world and it would be really nice to have SAGE programs that aren't in Europe even. Um, if you think about, there's, there's you know, we're doing our first one in, in Australia, there's New Zealand that, that has, you know, the, Africa has some English speaking places, India has the English speaking, if you're, if you're tied to speaking English, all around the world but you know beyond that there are just some really fascinating places that would really be great for our students to get to know and uh and so i, I what was the one that you have in there really specifically about latin america because i was interested in the um uh, and yeah, the other latin america especially andean region would you explain that 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 Verbiage right there. Yeah, well, there, there's a lot of initiatives um, surrounding uh, Andrew's involved in in some of these um, uh, surrounding the Andean region right now, and we've never done a study abroad, but it seems like there's there's a lot of faculty work that's being done down in in Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador um, right now, and it would be great to link up some of these efforts um, and to to really find some of this interdisciplinarity. And so, um, yeah, we'd we'd encourage that, especially because. Uh, we have so many students who the language wouldn't be an issue, right? Um, that they could they could do a SAGE program in Spanish because they have it from, you know, their mission or their heritage speakers or, or whatnot. So that there, there just seems like there's some really right possibilities there. Um, having said that, even something like Francophone Africa, um, just because it's Francophone, I don't think would preclude it. You'd have to it would take someone like you who can navigate, you know, the culture and the language for the students, but there's ways that I think a SAGE program could be really successful even in a place like Benham. You know, assuming the travel office lets people travel to. Yeah. Um, that kind of, how rooted in place do these SAGE programs, uh, how, well, how much should they be rooted? So, like, I know there's some study abroad, you know, you start in London, then you go to Paris, then they, you know, go do, you know, four or five other stops along the way. Um, most of these seem like they're pretty rude in place. And I know that, you know, like every study abroad is going to go out and do day trips, you know, maybe a couple of days here or there. But is there a vision of 
a stage program that moved from, I mean, just to use Africa, you start in Dakar, Senegal, swing through Ivory Coast and finish in Benin or something like that? I, I definitely think that there's a possibility for these. I, I always um, encourage caution on, on traveling programs um, to make sure that the, the traveling is really well motivated um, for the learning outcomes for, the, for that program. Um, it's really easy to think of a learning outcomes that could take you to, you know, to 10 different locations over the course of a term. I think that um, not only does that come at a, at a you know, literal cost um, that makes programs more expensive, I think there's a cost too in terms of developing some of those intercultural competencies where the students are deprived the opportunity to go a little bit deeper in the culture. Many of them will have opportunities to be tourists later on in life, and we want to avoid creating tourist experiences. We want experiences that, that go beyond that. And so there's no hard and fast rule, um, but that's kind of what you're playing with. You're playing with budget, you're playing with, you know, what can be accomplished, what should be accomplished, you know, those, those kinds of things, but absolutely ones that where we're, London cannot do that. London has a, um, there's a formula even of how many days you can be gone from the center and it has everything to do with cost. Students are paying for the London center, whether they're there or not. And so they're paying double if they're, you know, whenever they're out of the center. Um, likewise with some of the, uh, the apartments, we just have to be careful because that's going to drive up program costs if you're, if you're gone from there. Uh, if we're going to do a program in Spain, we're going to do it in Alcala. We're not going to do it in Toledo um, because it's um, that's where we have the resource that, that needs to be used. We don't have an apartment in Benin. So um, that, that actually kind of opens up other kinds of potential well, possibilities. Too, and I think one of the things that I, one of the reasons I haven't proposed one yet is that the cost of doing it to the same quality given the infrastructure available across West Africa, it's really hard. Yeah. It's crazy expensive. It's more mm -hmm. expensive to do it there than it would be. Well, and, and safety of you know the students and what you can effectively do, especially with people who are not expert in a discipline or the language, that that can limit some things. Yeah. I have a question about okay. Can you just talk through like is there's like a prep course that you do the semester before and then do people get like Course release after, or I don't, I don't know. I feel like sort of if that's a department level thing. Yeah. That's it. That's something you have to work out with your department, and di different departments have different approaches to that. Some of them say, "Hey, this is on you. <laughs> you know, this is coming out of your hide. You want this experience, you can do it, but we're not going to give you a course release." Others say, "Yeah, this is. We see this is. You know, you teach general education courses here for us. You know, in the department, this is teaching a general education education course. You know, elsewhere. So that's something you have to negotiate with your chair." Um, in terms of the prep course, there is a prep course, the full semester before you go, the second block of that full semester, you teach a one credit uh, preparation course. So for summer, is that spring or? That would winter? be winter. Winter. winter term, uh, semester. Yeah, the second block of winter, okay, okay. you would teach a, um, a prep course to, uh, for the students. Uh, you can get compensated for, uh, for that uh, through the evening school. Um, so if, Chip, yes. Chip, can I just add? So if you're going spring, let's see, spring, spring. A prep class for a spring study abroad, is that also taught in the winter? Taught in winter, yeah. Yeah, so spring, summer, and fall study abroads are all taught, the prep classes are all taught second half of winter semester. And right. it's basically a one credit evening class. Yeah. And it can be a really great opportunity to help your students hit the ground running. Um, Develop that, yeah. yeah. Connection. The Kennedy Center comes in and does other content a couple nice. of times. Yeah, they, they have some things, you they, yeah, safety yeah. things, things like that with insurance and, and that kind of thing. Okay. Did we hear some of the things people were, are dreaming of doing yeah. from the group? Yeah, we'll share. Sure, we're, we'll share. So Amber is in English. Are you? Yeah, I'm. I'm in actually English education, but my research is in writing and instructional pedagogy. Yeah. And I'm a developmental psychologist, and I study um, cross cultural groups, children, racism, discrimination, those kind of things. So we're thinking about doing a program, uh, cultural immersion and critical writing for advocacy, advocacy. Sorry, like how to humanize, connect, and build Zion through connection. Um, and so working heavily with immigrant populations wherever we would go. Um, again, since I teach cross cultural. Um, really interested, obviously, in uh, children in minoritized populations and families since I'm in the School of Family Life. And then we have a very heavy interest, at least in my students, and I think in yours too, in advocacy and how you get into these spaces. A lot of them, our students come from places where they know they have a lot of privilege, but they don't know what to do with it, but they want to do something with it. They're so passionate about building Zion, about helping 
uh, the poor and the needy, right, which is some of the four pillars um, of our church mission. And so helping them learn how to do that in the ways that are best suited to a BYU student, um, I think we could actually really do that. And with our backgrounds, we can get into spaces, Amber and Ed, um, me with a lot of immigrant populations. And we, we think about how transportable, like that skill of sort of writing for advocacy and like identifying your audience and understanding the rhetorical implications of the kinds of ways you can like tell a story or narrate somebody's experience or do some like ethnographic kinds of research with populations, not speaking for them, but speaking with them and sort of elevating voices and using writing in a way that helps to elevate and expand um, empathy and connection and understanding around experiences that may be different from the students sure. who are going. And I don't really believe in cultural competence. I believe in cultural humility. And so teaching that and teaching how to do that well, I think is a skill that our students desperately need. That's great. That's great. Cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Nobody Thank you. else wants to share now. We're embarrassed. We got excited. I can share one that we're working on right now, just kind of in the exploratory stages. We're working in Ecuador. Malcolm knows this. So we've got um, some indigenous groups down there. They're looking for assistance in kind of building their community, both physically and socially. So looking at ways to help students connect this notion of um, what is what is impact, what is positive impact with good, good uh, scholarship, because some of the things that we're looking to do are in areas that haven't been done before. So how do we connect those two together? So how do we look specifically at what is the environmental impact of some of the things that are happening? What are the social impacts? And then how do you shape your built environment in order to minimize those, but then provide a launch pad for people to to progress in the directions that they are setting in the in the ways that they want to go. So that's something that we're looking at right now. And you know, biologist, linguist, sociologist, engineer. Yep. I guess I can share. So I've got several ideas. I'm just trying to figure out which one is best. Um, working with a guy in the um, a professor in the religion department who's really interested in sort of freedom of, of religion and belief. Um, I've done a lot of uh, family policy advocacy. Um, and so I study global family patterns uh, and trying to identify uh, what things are sort of useful differences that we can all learn from and what are some of the universalities that benefit families. Um, and so we've got one proposal that we're thinking about um, looking at that uh, family policy, family advocacy, um, combined with freedom of religion and belief, was sort of using the family proclamation as one of the lens uh, to do it. Um, but then uh, for the SAGE programs, there's lots of things that are kind of stewing in my in, in my head, but they mostly have to do with that sort of uh, what can we do to uh, improve family life in ways that will be helpful uh, in sort of universal ways, because contrary to what we often think, there are things that all family that are beneficial for all families, mm -hmm. but they don't tend to get very much attention. Um, but that's where I'm kind of interested in finding a partner, see if there's somebody. Uh, I've got lots of ways that I think it could connect, but I'm not smart enough to know if that's true or not. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we're uh, past the time that we said we would keep you. Um, I know I can hang around here for uh, for a little while, and maybe a couple other Sage members. Um, can too. Thank you for being here. Let us know how we can how we can help and how we can uh, advise. Uh, we're excited about you know your interest and uh, what we can do to, to help you out. So thanks. Chip, would you share my email address for anyone who? Uh, so anyone who's interested in reaching out, um, if you have specific questions about London and London programs as opposed to other programs, I'm happy to I'm happy to answer any questions over email or have a future Zoom meeting with anyone who's interested. So. If you'll just share my email with people. Thanks, Cecilia.